the lady with the pink pink spade. I was <laughs> I was kind of I was I was introduced to your account um, a couple probably about a year year and a bit ago um, to the lady that kitted her cruise out with these pink accessories. But I found I found so much interest um, in your content that you were creating at the time. But still to this day, and I'm going to be honest, I, I'm not 100 percent sure exactly what your game farm produces. Is it a game farm? Does it do just uh, you know the the normal tours that we see, or or do you guys actually hunt? Um, well, okay. So I know. I guess I don't really explain what I do and who I am on my TikTok account. So on my social media account. So it is something that I'm working on, um, but it's a lot to put in one video. You know, to explain who you are, what you do. Um, so what I do is I have a farm in the Northwest Province. Um, and it's actually a heritage property. So I have a hotel on property. It's 66 bedrooms, um, and we do conferencing. And so I run the hotel. And then, of course, my passion is um, I have a, a game farm. Um, and they're two separate entities, but, um, you know, they're, they're both in the same location. And so, yes, no, of course I hunt. Um, of course we hunt. You know, that is that's not really a negotiable or something that you can not have if you're if you're a game farmer right yeah no 100 percent. so just before we get into it obviously I, I should have probably started off this way a little bit of an introduction am i pronouncing it correctly sarah uh fourth forsyth forsyth cool so you yeah so tell us a little bit about where you are where you're based um and then how how you got to to handling this this wonderful project of yours yeah um okay so i um we're based just out of rustenburg um and i grew up in the hospitality industry and this is actually our um our family business um and this is one of our hotels and then our farm um and so i was just given honestly the god given privilege of uh running this place and looking after it um what's really incredible about it besides the amazing wildlife and i'll get into that and what our farm looks like but um this is actually the original farm of paul kruger before he became president of the transvaal um and so we have his original homes on property um, and that's a museum. And then the whole hotel is themed around the history of South Africa. Um, and so we do a lot of projects with that. And that's also, you know, one of my biggest passions. I don't know why, but um, I just fell in love with history. And I guess it, it was probably a, a lot from my dad. Um, and so it's, it's a mixture between nature and history. We always say it's where history and nature meet. Um, and so the farm is called Book and Hotefontein. Um, and I always say that Paul Kruger could have chosen anywhere, right? He could have chosen anywhere, um, but he specifically chose this spot. And when you actually see the farm, you understand why. So uh, we have a wetland that runs through the entire property, um, almost from start to finish. And it's I, I actually had the um, Department of Environment here the other day and they were studying the wetland and they said in the whole region they've never seen anything like it. Um, it really is that phenomenal. And so conservation is a huge part of it. Um, my father restored the wetland. And so, yeah, a whole nother aspect. I'm also busy fighting off mines right now um, because we're in the center of really the largest platinum deposit in South Africa. Um, and there's a lot of history with that as well. Uh, so that's, that's also a big thing that we're doing right now because, um, within the past less than a year, I think we've, we've fought off about eight, nine applications to mine around here. Now, so for the, for the people that don't quite understand how this whole thing works, will that fall under the, um, the opportunity for these people to land, grab your guys land or, or does it go through a tender process, uh, or does it fall under the dreaded word that we've we've used constantly. Sorry, um, but does it is it you know land without compensation type thing? 
No. So what it is, is actually in this country. So what you do is if you want to mine, you, you get a prospecting license, right? Or you apply to get a prospecting license. That means that you can go prospect on that property and see what minerals are there. But they already know what minerals are there. Often it's just for a tender game. Um, but you don't want to risk them drilling into your water table. But basically, anybody can apply to mine on any property in South Africa without requesting it. It's completely legal. So if you have a property, you just have to, your chances, you have to object basically to the application and hope your object, objection like pulls through. But anybody, <laughs> anybody can, can apply to mine anywhere on any property. Um, who, who's, who's make sorry, so who's making those decisions? Who's who? If you object, who's going to make the final call on that? The departments. Um, yeah. So, so when these guys, when when these guys come along for with their applications, what what is your strong proposal that you put forward to the department to try and deter them away from it? So we are so blessed because we actually have leverage, right? So one, it's the history, um, the importance of the history here, because those houses were built like, you know, almost 200 years ago. Um, <clears throat> and then it's the wetland and the nature we have here. So actually, the this particular um, section of the department is... I mean, they've spent money to be able to come here and start studying this wetland, and they're still doing it. So, um, you know, I was really just amazed and grateful to them um, for doing that. So hopefully if we get that wetland classified as something significant, they won't be able to come within a certain radius. Um, and that's the fight, you know. It's a big fight. But it's with it, David and Goliath sort of situation. You know, this, this place is so special that it's not possible it can be lost. You know, it's not – it's – yeah, hopefully one day you'll see it. Um, yeah, so I was I was just trying to say that um, what is your motivation behind it, other than the history? Um, I did see in a couple of your videos that that your dad unfortunately is no longer with you guys. If I tell me if I'm making a mistake here, but um, is that probably one of the driving forces, or or you guys 100 percent invested into this and to make it work? Um, so. <laughs> I'm 100% invested to make it work, but it's definitely because, you know, partly because it was my father's passion. Like, I always say um, I am my father's son, you know, and um, he just, he loved this place and he, he invested so much passion into it. Um, he built it, planted it, um, collected all this history. I mean, <clears throat> my father has the biggest collection of Anglo-Boer War militaria and memorabilia in the world. Um I'm pretty sure he has the biggest gun collector's license in South Africa. Like it is, it's, it's incredible. And it's not something that can just disappear. You know, um, people, people have lost this idea of inheriting something. And, um, I, I often think that's sometimes it's quite sad, um, because your family or your parents can build you an empire and, um, why not take it to the next sort of the next height? And my father always said, he said, um, he expects his children to be better than, than he was. And that's a, that's a big mission. Um, but I know, I know, I know he would expect it, you know? So, yeah, yeah. and just his love for this place, he, he bought piece by piece by piece by piece to, you know, make it as big as it is today. And he restored that wetland and it's just, um, it's a very special place. And obviously, there's a lot more I want to do. Um, I'd love to have a a big farm one day that I can stand in the middle and then turn 360 degrees and all the mountains are mine, you know? Yeah. Like a thousand head of buffalo or something cool like that. Um, so so the goals keep coming, you know, but, but this is definitely where my heart is. So before I get into the, the animal side of things, I know also one of the most interesting videos I watched was um, your guys' monument. Could you tell us a little bit more about that and, and the backstory on that? Uh, of course. Uh, thanks for asking. Um, so every year we unveil a monument for something significant in South Africa's history. Um, and 
it's it's most of the figures are completely controversial, right? Because everybody has so many opinions and we have extremely controversial statues here and monuments. Um, but that's because those figures played such a fundamental part in our history and why we are the way we are today. I mean, it's a pure reflection of what we've been through um, over hundreds of years. And um, so, so this year, uh, last year, I guess, I um, decided to do somebody who's called Mzilagazi. So mostly we've been centered, focusing around the South African war or anglo Boer war, which is amazing. And I can talk to you about it for hours. Um, uh, but I now want to start going further back in history, right? Um, not, not forward, not beyond 1904, um, but, but backwards. Um, and so Mzilla Kazi was slightly before that, but his role, um, in South Africa and his influence that impacted the anglo Boer war was quite interesting. So I thought he was an amazing link. And, um, yeah, the story of Mzilla Kazi is one that everybody should know. You know, everybody sort of knows Shaka Zulu, Shaka Zulu, but um, Shaka Zulu, this might be controversial, almost pales in comparison to what Mzilagazi did. Um, and both of them are extremely controversial figures. They, they killed a lot of people, they destroyed a lot, um, but you might as well not talk about the history of South Africa if you don't talk about them. You, what they did impacts everybody. Um, and so do all these other characters like Cecil John Rhodes or um, Jan Smuts or Mahatma Gandhi, who's controversial in his own way, but most people don't know, Winston Churchill. Um, and so we have all these figures here, which is it's quite incredible because then you really get to understand this this country. Um, interestingly, I, I never took history as a subject in school, um, but I sort of liked my, my father's passion. And... I studied in the States, um, and my last semester, I took a class called History of South Africa just for the hell of it, because I wanted to see what all these American kids were going to say about South Africa, and um, that class completely changed my life forever. Like, I learned more about my country than I ever have in a semester in America, um, and that is what really set alight my passion for history, for sure, because... Yeah, I believe that the greatest history is the greatest tool to heal in in a country that's so hurt and people that are so hurt. Um, and if they only knew what happened, there things would be a little bit different. I love that, and I, I, I honestly I I couldn't agree with you more because I just kind of think a lot of the times we we try and fight the history that we have um, instead of kind of embracing it and and understanding that these are the mistakes we need to learn from in the past and and drive forward and. And have a better country to live by, but yeah, unfortunately, not all of us see it that way. But and and that's why I think um, it's really important on what you're doing. And you know, a lot of a lot of my situation with 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 our industry is that I've always based a lot of what I do with experience, right? So people come out not only just to hunt, but I want them to I want to give them the full experience about enjoying uh, the history of South Africa and different things like that, and. Really, I, I take I take my hat off to you. It's it's such a different way of approaching the industry, and and it's something I'm really looking forward to. Hopefully, one day experience it because it's incredible. But before before we get too much into the history side of things, because I I, I think that's a whole nother podcast on its own, and I it I really, really is. Wanna, Sorry, I really want to. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. That's perfect, and I, I do want to have that that podcast. But before we get into it, you you said so your um. Your farm was based on on a on a rich wetland, right? So, my question to you was just to start things off: Have you been able to introduce any exotic species? And when I say exotic, I mean African exotics like sable, roe, and that sort of stuff. Or have you kind of had to keep it kind of traditional, um, where you can only have you know what was on that land previously? No. Um... So I we're we're open to bringing in um, different species. Definitely, uh, even even going so far as to trees, right? We plant different um, native South African tre uh, African trees, Southern African. I don't even think we have any Zimbabwean trees here, 
but yeah, um, that that's a very big part of, of what we do. Um, and we have Sable here. I actually would like to get Lechway at some point in time, um, but that is a bit of a complicated, complicated thing. Um, but yeah, no, we don't stick to any particular rule there. Uh, yeah. Having having the hotel and then having your your game entity to it, I know it complements each other. But have there any have there been any challenges um, in the past for maybe guests or or people that have kind of seen it from an unethical point of view? Sometimes, um, you know, generally we try to advertise that we're very African. Um, you know, our our rooms are all sort of built in almost a hut style, so it's thatch roofs and stone walls and it's a very, very African feel. But um, if somebody's scared of a, fried, a spider or a frog or, you know, something like that, sometimes it becomes a little bit of a, that's the only negative thing. Otherwise, the, the bush, the animals are, you know, but it's, it's people's fear of almost the little critters that is the biggest negative influence, I think. And um, would you say majority of your guests are from overseas or is it local based? Um... So beforehand, prior to COVID, majority were from overseas, um, uh, but we, we do a lot of conferencing as well. So, you know, people in the general area, um, government conferencing, um, and then people that are traveling out um, this way just to escape for the weekend. So it's not, it's not a solid sort of client basis. I'd say the biggest thing is conferencing for us. Um, that's my, my sort of bread and butter. But tour groups are starting to come back from overseas, which is awesome. And yeah. most of that will probably be testament to your marketing skills. So I wanted to get into that a little bit. What, what has been some of the challenges from a marketing perspective uh, that you found in the last couple of years, since COVID, basically? Yeah. Um, so I haven't really had the job of um, – marketing that's sort of done it at head office that manages all of the hotels um i try to i'm starting a sort of a, a tiktok account for it um to get something out on that side at least that i can do but um yeah i think it's just making sure that you continually produce content which is you know a challenge I, in itself um and it i think it would be easier if we had somebody who created content that was based on property um yeah, yeah. That, that definitely makes more more sense because a lot of your videos are, are very captivating. So I, I, I saw you, you mentioned something about a video about how you guys went about the culling and did you get any backlash from that or is, is there a specific reason why you had that video up? Um, I guess it just, it, it made me angry, you know, and um, it's something that, that I've, always been been talking about you know since since high school I've been trying to be outspoken about hunting um mm. and the benefits of it uh and so I guess his his video just pissed me off a little bit and I got angry and I, I, I did a video um but most of the comments were pretty good um I'd like to do something that's a bit more in depth um but yeah, even university, again, I, I was in America and you know that most of them especially university they're they're pansies right there um they are snowflakes and um, it's very hard as a sort of more conservative person to be based in those universities mm. because you're ostracized a lot. Um, but I took a philosophy class and they had um, a competition, a philosophy essay competition. And um, I decided I was going to write it on elephant culling, right? I was just going to go, <laughs> just going to straight gonna there, do as much know? as I possibly could. <laughs> no mercy. Um <laughs> And, and I wrote this paper, short paper, and I won. It was my freshman year. I won out of the entire university. And I went to, I won the contest. I went to my professor and I said, can I go to the dean of, you know, the, the philosophy department and just thank them? Um, and he was like, your paper won because it was so good, but none of them like you. Like, none of them liked it. I would recommend you don't go and say anything to anybody. So it also, it's a reminder of how um, how stupid people can be. You know, mm. maybe that's the wrong word, but you can write a paper that's good enough to win, but still they have conflicting ideas about it. Um, yeah, is, interesting. Is there, is there any point of your content that you want to get out there that 
would, like you call them snowflakes, would try and trans, you know, not convert, because I think convert is a, is a very terrible word to use, but um, kind of depict hunting in a completely different manner. Um, I know I've tried really hard, yeah. but it kind of lands on deaf ears. But is, is there a different approach that, that you think that a lot of um, traditional ways can go about it? Or is that something that you're just trying to feel as you go along? Um, well, I think it's something I'd definitely like to accomplish, you know, um, but yeah, I would just need to, to do more, more content about it. Uh, but I'm trying to, you know, get, get my following up before I really start pissing people off. And that's, <laughs> that's, Cause that's a draw card, right? The, the more pissed off they know, get, it seems get, like get the more they listen. Get some more followers. And, <laughs> well, actually, maybe that's the truth as well, right? It's, it's, you want people who follow you that believe in the same, um, same things that you believe in. So it's definitely something that, that I'll put more and more into, into my content. Um, and hopefully this up and coming hunting season will be good and I'll be able to do that. Um, bought some marketing tools like a drone and, and stuff like that. So you can use that on hunts as well. Um, nice. so yeah, we'll make some content. I, th- I, th- I think that's the biggest thing, right? And, and with somebody like yourself that has been successful in the content creation platform is people get inquisitive. So I love it. You know, I, I do encourage a lot um, of people to engage with a lot of my content, but at the same time, I try and make it attractive enough for people to get inquisitive. And I think that's the most important part. So are, are you a professional hunter yourself um, or do you hire in professional hunters? How does it work? Right, so I'm actually not a qualified PH, but um, but I take I take the clients out, and you're allowed to do that with local local clients. I do have mm. um somebody mm. who who works with me in almost like half my heart. Her name's Kayla, and she manages my game farm. Um, and she's a PH, so uh, but actually I'm I'm doing my PH course in April, which is super nice. exciting. And then um because I want that before I become an outfitter, just because. I feel like you, I shouldn't without that qualification, you know, I should earn that qualification and then become an outfitter. Yeah, I just yeah. think that's the right process. Um, and yeah, then they're going to be an outfitter and then I'm going to get those American hunters in like there's no tomorrow. Um, and I think the history draw is also a big card. Uh, mm. Cause I, I, I know you saw, I was, I, I'm sure you saw, I was at um, the Dallas Safari club convention mm. and um uh, it was it was just awesome, and everyone that I spoke to um, had a huge interest, specifically in the history and the fact that they could go shoot on you know an old president's farm. And so, yeah, I think I think that it's an exciting prospect, and of course, it's it's what we need, right? South African um, built on hunters only pay so much, and mm-hmm. yes, we need them, but we also need to have a fairly full pocket to be able to do the things that we need to do. Um, and American hunters are such a blessing to us. I really, really do think so. International, international hunters. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, I mean, I, I went over to SCI. I just couldn't believe, I mean, I've been going over to I those saw. shows since, since um, 2015. And probably now more than ever before have I realized what a, what a massive influence, not only does the American um, clientele base have on our industry, but as well as their politics. I mean, when their politics have gone for a ball of shit. So, you know, the whole industry suffers this side. But um, yeah. so how, how was Dallas? Well, what is your perspective on that? Um, were you there promoting uh, your your hunting facility, your camp, your hotel? Or did you just go there just to kind of get a feel of what, what it's all about? Yeah, well, so we, we were on holiday in the States. Um, and I knew that that time overlapped. So I said, okay, well, if I'm there over, you know, that convention, I have to go, there's no other option. And so I went and I sort of just marketed myself on the floor, you know, um, obviously didn't have a stand or a booth or anything, get there one day, today's not the day. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it was really amazing. And I met a lot of people and some good contacts. And so we'll, you know, and uh, you, my, my dad always used to say, he said, because often sometimes when we sit in a class or something, we, we get frustrated when we can't remember everything, right? Mm. So we were having this conversation, and my dad said, you can't put your hand inside a honey jar 
and not take it out and have honey left on your hand, right? So you can't. Mm. Um, and I, I really do believe in that philosophy. Um, you go put yourself out there and God will send whatever he wants your way, your way. That's, that's how it works. So, but the politics is very highly tied into it. Um, when I was in uh, Texas, I mean, um, yeah, I, I got to meet um, Donald Trump Jr. Very, very short, you know, very, very short moment in time. Um, but yeah, politics is very highly, highly involved. And that's sort of because I guess people on certain sides think more sensibly mm. than others. <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I wanted to maybe kind of a, a controversial question, maybe in some would view it, but being in a in a male dominant industry, what ha, what have been some of the challenges that you fought, or what have been some of the perspectives that you've tried to change? Because look, I'm I'm all for um, females getting into it. I love it because I honestly believe. Um, I, I think the biggest thing about our industry is is people relate to people, right? So, you know, you're not always going to get a hunter that comes out and, and connects with you. Um, and you're not always going to get a female hunter that comes out and connects with you. But having people that influence our industry in such a positive and unique way, and, and women do that a lot of the time. And, and hence, when I was over in SCR, I actually saw it more often than not that the the men of the of the outfitting company actually kind of took a back seat and it was the wives that were promoting and getting involved and doing the whole thing but for me that was just such a, a complete shift of opinion or, or shift of a, of a vision that i've seen traditionally in the industry for for 14 years now and it's so nice to see it's refreshing right it's, it's so refreshing to see women getting involved and really taking in essence, the bull by the horns and driving this thing forward. So have you had any challenges um, or anything that's motivated you to keep going? I actually knew you were going to ask me this question. So, um, <laughs> so let me take it back actually to a book I read. Okay. I read it when I was quite young um, and it's called Atlas Shrug by Anne Rand. And the main character is a female, and she runs this sort of empire, and she puts um, railway tracks across America, and um, you know, and and that woman can. It's everything is based on a meritocracy, right? You you earn something. I feel like there's there's no difference between a man and a woman in terms of what they can achieve, maybe in what they can lift up, you know, and how fast they can run, mm. and and of course certain different roles that we should play together. But um, other than that, why can't we do something somebody else could do? I'm not scared of catching snakes, but a man might be scared of catching snakes. You know, it, um, <laughs> so the only challenge is preconceived ideas. So um, it's when people think they can take the piss out on you because you're a female, mm -hmm. right? So that they can um, pay less for something or uh, try, you know, it's uh, so you just have to be on top of your game because if you know your stuff, nobody can fool around with you. Huh. Um, but I would say the biggest challenge, um, and since you asked the question, I'm going to answer the question. The biggest challenge is the objectification. Um, and I'm sure actually that's also in any, any industry, anything you're in, in life. Um, but it's, it's, um, you just want to be there, do your job, you know, have a good hunt, and that's it, you know. I can organize you time at the casino at Sun City. That's no problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, so, like, I can, you know, I can help you out. I can send you there. But um, so it's, it's, that, it's that sort of thing where there's um, people find it hard to draw a line. Um, so it's mm. having the same sort of respect as you'd have for your male you know, pH, you're not going to try, um, get a little bit too close to him. And so that's the only frustrating thing. Um, and so I would, I would actually love to have a lot of female hunters. That would be awesome. Cause I could just have a break some days, you know? Um, <laughs> but, uh, on, on the, on the big, like the, the grander scheme of things, I, 
it's not it's I don't think it's hard being you know in love with nature and on the farm and hunting um I I got the bug my brother didn't uh you know I <laughs> I grew up in the bush felt um it's just always been my biggest passion so I never seen gender attached to really anything I have to be honest mm -hmm. I think it's it's quite ridiculous um to think that there should be some quota like I, I know a lot of places in America think that there needs to be a quota of like you know let's do this many females and this many males same applies to many other things it's ridiculous <laughs> Um, things need to be based on merit. And if you're the best at what you do, if I'm going to make them the most money, are they not going to choose me? Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, you um, know, just, just to butt in there, I mean, your story relates so much to that of my mom. I was, I lost my father at a very young age and my mom kind of took over his, his business that he started and it was a tire business and it's still going to today and, and her and my brother are running wow. it extremely so But I kind of, I, when I was first introduced to your TikTok account, yeah, I saw this pink spade getting bolted down to a, a beige Toyota Land Cruiser. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, <laughs> I see you diving in a pond after a kudu. I think it was a kudu that had, had passed away in the Koi Pond or whatever it may be. And I related so much yeah. to that, to, to what my mom experienced in, in, in a male dominant industry, right? So she, she would ro rock up to the, to the tire shops in a, in a dress, but yet she's, she's the one rolling tires around the shop and barking orders and stuff, which was, it, in so many different ways, it's it's kind of inspiring. And for somebody that's been in the industry for for some time now, and you really kind of want that breath of fresh air, right? You want the industry to grow, and the only way it's going to grow is if things get done differently. And and that's that's why your accounts intrigued me so much was because things are being done traditionally but differently, kind of in a sense, you know. So. I, Kudos to you. Keep going. I mean, it's it's absolutely Thank wonderful you. watching your stuff. Where where to from here? Where where would you like to go? What what are the, some of the goals you have in mind? Um, plan for maybe just this upcoming season or ten years time. Right. Um. So, with with the the game and the game farm, um, I really want to start breeding um really really good um beautiful specimens. <laughs> Um, so I have been working on getting the blood right. Um, and so that's really pushing to breed some of those. I got some King Villabius, uh, actually really nice. big blessing. I have a cool story about it. If you want to hear the story. Yeah, of course. Of I, um, course. there's a, um, a man called Krier van Zeil and he has one of the biggest, um, King Villabius, even Royal Villabius, um, sort of stud farms, stud breeding farms in South Africa. Um, and he came, stayed at my hotel before the Peter Toy auction last year. And we got, got talking and I was telling him about the, him and his um, wife about the history of this place. And he said, I'm going to give you three King Villalibias to run on Paul Kruger's farm. <laughs> so... <laughs> we drove to Limpopo and picked them up really quickly. That was just <laughs> incredible. Um, it was amazing. So I'd like to, you know, I want to see what's going to happen with them. Um, mm. And then obviously PH Outfitter and then International Hunters. So that's um, that's really a big goal for this place. And then eventually I'd like to get another farm where I can have buffalo. Um, that's, that's also on the list. And then with this hotel, um, it's continuing – I actually, I don't want to tell you the end goal because it's very controversial and I'll really get into trouble for it on this app of maybe, um, and I got to build up, build up. but, um, basically I'm going back further and further in history, um, is what I want to do with this hotel and really make it a, a place where people just can't come to South Africa and not visit it because it explains everything to them. Um, and I want it to be a place of healing. So that's sort of, that's the goal for this place. Um, for now, yeah. I, I want to tell you about my cruiser. Can I tell you why I put pink on her? Please do. Okay, cool. So everywhere I was driving, people were asking me, is this your boyfriend's car? Is this your husband's car? And I decided, <laughs> no. I said, that is not happening to me. I am not going to put up with this. 
Um, and so I just was like, okay, pink, 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 put pink on her. So everybody knows she's mine. And that's that. <laughs> yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's why she has, uh, has pink on her. <laughs> that is brilliant. So uh, how many species have you got on your property at the moment? Goodness. Um, well, well antelope species, 14. Different. Okay. Well, like um, planes game, 14. And then, um, then we have just lots of incredible animals that have just obviously filled the, the environment. Um, I've started to see vultures coming this way and I've never uh -huh. seen them before, which is really warming my heart. And we built a little vulture table and, um, and you know, there's honey badger and, um, secretary birds and it, and it's actually, it's a, it's a small piece of property. Um, it is about 470 hectares, right? So I hope you can't hear all those um, things coming through my phone. Um, so no. it's quite a small property, but it's just so rich and it has so much life uh, in it. And that's why I also want to want to get another property at some point so I can put put bigger game on it. But but just the despite how small it is, I mean, it's just you never seen anything like it. I promise you. It's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. No, and I mean, from what I've seen, it it looks absolutely magnificent. And and like you said, I mean, I've I've never really experienced null spray as as a whole to hand, but uh, I've definitely been my fair share up in Limpopo and those places like that. So we must definitely make a plan and come down and come see the property. I would love to understand more a little bit about our history as well, you know. And and this seems like the perfect place to go to before. Um, before we, we close off, I've got a couple of important tasks I need you to do for me. Firstly, um, we are running uh, a promotion a giveaway on, on our YouTube channel, right? So you are the lucky person that gets to choose what we give away for this episode. So you get to choose between a Vortex Crossfire Scope and a handcrafted uh, olive wood uh, I want to say it's made out of a vase, but I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. But handcrafted uh, butcher's knife. You get to choose, and whoever gets to gets the answer right in, in the in the post that will follow, will have a great opportunity at having one of these gifts. Uh, the scope is okay. my choice. So we're giving the scope away, and then we've started a new segment on the on the podcast. <clears throat> where I'm going to ask you two kind of difficult questions. They, they tend to be a little bit more difficult. So my first one is, um, what would you like to see uh, come from the industry with you in it? And secondly, if you are to leave a legacy behind, what would be the best legacy you possibly see foresee in the future to leave behind? So um, can I answer these questions together or must I go one by one? It's up to you. Do it together. Okay. Um, so I suppose the the goal would be firstly to, to get the message out there and get it received that hunting is a fundamental part of conservation, right? Um, if only we could spread that message far enough so that the big greenies running these idiotic uh, NGOs could, could understand. So that is obviously a huge goal. Then I would love to see game meat, um, you know, available on the shelves. That, that would be incredible um, because I feel like, you know, things have, have value and there's a market for them. Right. So if you stop eating cows, nobody's going to breed them anymore. Um, and so the more game we game meat we eat, um, the more we can breed game. And it's obviously also venison is the healthiest meat that you can eat. It's lean. It's um, the kindest way that an animal can live. You know, uh, they're not getting injected with a whole bunch of chemicals. So I would love to see game meat on the shelves. Um, and then, of course, I think if we could get certain areas in South Africa protected, um, that would be something very, very valuable. If we can get them protected so that animals can have certain designated places where, where they'll be safe. Um, and 
yeah. I mean, I think there are, there are a lot more things, but I guess that would be, those would be the big ones. Something like what um, Roosevelt did, right? <clears throat> that's, that's, that's awesome. And uh, I mean, we, <laughs> we could carry on with this podcast for a very, very long time, but um, I, I do, I'll, I would, I would love to have you back on. Um, I think I, I would really like to have the main focus on as on the on the history side and what you're doing from from a history point of view because I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, but yeah, just in closing, I just want to say thank you for everything you've done uh, for our industry. You've brought it in such a such a colourful and, and respectable light, and it's and it's really. It's it's so overwhelming to have somebody with fresh new ideas and, and a fresh and a, and a different approach to the industry as a whole, and um, I've got to commend you on that. It's been absolutely in, inspirational to us. So keep it up. I love your content, and um, yeah, hopefully we stay in touch and 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 then definitely have you on the podcast soon. Yeah, that will be wonderful. Thank you. It's been cool. great. I really enjoyed it. I'm glad. Have a good one, Sarah. Thank you. You too, Dylan.